Hello everyone, and welcome to this Asia Edit Author Success Webinar. I'm Trevor Lane, an Education Consultant at Asia Edit. For the past 25 years, I've been helping thousands of researchers to publish and present their research so they can turn their interesting findings into useful and impactful results. In this webinar, I'll be sharing some tips with you on how to effectively present your work at international conferences. In this hour, we'll cover how to prepare posters, how to prepare slides, and my top tips for actually delivering your presentation. In the final 10 to 15 minutes, there will be a reserved, a special slot reserved for Q&A, question and answers, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So before we begin, a word about the Zoom buttons. To make the webinar interactive, I'll be asking you to raise and lower your virtual hand and to type into the chat box function if you, uh, when I ask you some questions. But if you want to ask a question in the Q&A session, please do type your question in the question box at any time or during the Q&A session itself. So let's begin with the poster preparation. And there's a few of you already now here. So um, I'd like to ask you to type in the chat box. So in a live conference, of course, your poster has to stand out and be noticed by busy people in the busy room. So this is going to be similar to this road sign, which has to grab the attention of drivers. So please, in the chat box, can you type what features you notice about this sign that will make it stand out to busy, fast drivers and they can quickly read it still. So please type in the chat box your ideas. Yes, some diagrams. Lots of white space, very good observation. So it's not crowded, it's easy to pick out the words when you drive past. The big H for hospital, yes. Um, I'm going to give you some more hints, some more examples. How about these? So let's try to get some rules for uh, some principles that we can use in conference posters as well. Sharp colors, good, that's a good one. So red, black, blue, high saturation. Yes, it's not pink. Uh, it's quite a dark blue, quite dark red. Contrast, good. So black and white. So those are very good observations and we can use uh, the same principles in research posters, slides as well. So let's have a look. So first of all, there's clear borders to show that this is a sign. And then there's big clear fonts, lots of generous spacing. We call it white space, even though it might not be white, it's just blank space. And limited fonts or typefaces. So it's usually just one, but different sizes. And either black on white or bold black or dark text in a white or light box, or the opposite, exactly as you said for high contrast. Bold white, we also call it reverse lettering, uh, or light text on a dark box. Now, all caps is useful for hierarchy, for something really important, like the magic roundabout. Now, that's actually in Swindon, in south, the south of England, near Oxford. Uh, where else? Um, another train coming, that's quite important. Drivers of long, low vehicles, so that's trying to get their attention. But of course, all caps, all capitals is a bit like shouting. So it works for these road signs, but don't overdo it in posters and also in emails. And sentence case, uh, so this is... a uh, where only the first word has a capital letter. Um, otherwise, if it's title case, the important words have capital letters and it's too distracting because the eyes have to stop at each word. And there's no end punctuation, no period or full stop to make everything look neater. And so we don't have to stop at every line. And there's clear, simple graphics that we see. There's the roundabouts, there's a person walking. So those principles we can use in our posters as well. Now, let's look at the fonts then of 
let's transfer some of the principles to posters. So limit the number of fonts. And of course, the biggest and boldest will be the top headline or the title of your poster. So here it's, uh, we recommend 100 point in bold. And you can either use serif font or sans serif font. So serif are the little tick marks at the end of the S, so little caps, and the R, the I, the F, compared with sans serif or non serif, where the thickness is the same all the way throughout the lettering. And you might think it's clearer to see, but if it's big, it's big anyway. And then subtitles, so this would be the name and institution on your poster, can also be serif or sans serif. Now, the problem with serif is actually it is based on book reading. So if it's big, it's OK. If it's small on the page, it's OK. But when you use some artwork, for example, the reverse type on a black box, some of those little fine tick marks are going to disappear or fade away or look fuzzy. So it actually looks out of focus. So serif fonts like Times New Roman on top of black with reverse text is not good, whereas sans serif is OK on colored boxes. but probably not on black boxes. Now the headings inside your poster can be 36 point and then the body text is 24 point and the footnotes can be 18 point but nothing lower than that. And uh, examples would be Times or Palatino or Bookman Old Style for the serif fonts and then sans serif could be Arial, Montserrat, Cabin, Trebuchet. And you'll see that the thickness can differ uh, for different fonts. So even the sans serif fonts, some will be better for headings uh, and some will be better for body text. And then for one font family, there could be different uh, line weights as well. So it could be good not to use too many even sans serif fonts, so limit to two, or you could limit to one, but use the different weights of the same family. For example, we see Calibri in the body text and then the footnotes is Calibri Light, so a lighter version. So the fonts are important for visibility, so for the physical aspects, but also emotional. So some people don't like using the serif fonts, so limit it to only their title and headings because it does stand out, it's slightly different, but then for basic reading and posters, it's best to use sans serif. Serif is also a little bit old fashioned, so if you want to look traditional and old fashioned, then you can use serif font. However, don't use these ones because they really are distracting and Comic Sans looks like comic um, and it is not professional, it gives the wrong emotion. Impact is like newspaper headline, but you can't really read a lot of that um, in a whole sentence. Lucida handwriting is like handwriting. And then French script and monotype cursiva are more decorative, elegant fonts that you'd see in certificates. So again, you wouldn't see paragraphs of it. And then Korean new is like the old typewriters where every letter is actually in its same square shape area. So it's very difficult to read. Normally the fonts will be tuned, so the distance between the lettering is more natural, but typewriter type, again, unless you want it for a special effect, should be avoided. Now, as well as the text messages, we have to look at the overall content messages. So another example we can look at for uh, how we can apply this for posters is information posters. So not adverts, because that would be a bit too marketing. They have their own language um, and it wouldn't be appropriate for academic posters. But this is an example of a Japanese uh, public announcement poster to avoid getting infected by COVID. So avoid the three C's. And it's lots of information packed in here, but very um, cleverly done. And so we call this information design. We can see the purpose is right at the top, actually. So important notice for um, preventing COVID. And then the main headline, avoid the three Cs. They've tried to group it to make it look uh, simple and easy to remember. So three Cs, then they explain closed spaces, crowded places, close contact settings. And those are the key messages. So they've really distilled it into the most important points, they've used dark on light, clear, simple figures, 
a call out. So that little speech bubble in red uh, is pointing to the most important part of the concept. So there's the Venn diagram of one, two, and three, and the color coded, and it's the same as the three C's. And of course, where they all meet, don't go to those places where all the three C's meet. The bottom is acknowledgements with the logos of the government departments. And then the bottom right is known as the call to action. So we see it's a QR code and people have to click on it and get more information. That's really what the government wants people to do. And this is similar to uh, advert posters that normally the information flows from the top left to the bottom right. The bottom right is going to be the most important point uh, because in English, our eyes will follow that direction. So normally they will put the contact information there of the company, the company logo, phone this number, 10% discount. They'll put something there. That's the call to action to make you do something. So from this example, we see there are clear messages and also the clear artwork, text, and layout. So definitely in your research posters, don't do this. We don't use manuscript journal style tables. There's too much information. Unless you have a small table and really highlight the data you want people to look at. And don't use figures with lots of legends. It's not really the same style. Uh, you do have some methods and results, but not as much as in that figure there. So here's an example of the right amount of information in a figure. So the same principles about messaging and artwork apply to the whole poster, but also each figure. Think of each figure like a mini poster. So here we have a clear uh, title, which is the main message again. Good posters have clear messaging and effective layout. Then I show you another Japanese poster. I put some call outs, some pointers to the important parts. And then the bottom, there's uh, only five lines of legend. So keep it to five lines. And uh, there's a QR code at the bottom right of that figure as well. So that's a good example to follow. So here's a test for you. Can you type in the chat box which you think is better, poster A or poster B? So this is portrait uh, orientation, portrait direction vertical, so like a portrait, like the Mona Lisa or a passport photo. So tell me which one you think is the better one and maybe why. So we have a B. Someone else with B. Okay, look, quite a few with B. So B is good, it's not too dark. Um, yes, it's, it's, there's more graphics, someone says. So it's a little bit more visually stimulating. So again, we want interest. There's nothing wrong with just white background. Actually, there's pros and cons of both posters. So let's have a look and apply some of the principles from the road sign from the UK and the poster information poster from Japan. Uh, so A has a light background, B has a tinted background, which is fine as long as you can still read the text. It's more expensive to print though, remember, if you're printing on um, at a printer shop because of the ink. Uh, a you can read that top part, computer games in the developing world. So you should be able to read the headline a meter away, three or four feet away. You can't really read the one in B. And But A, um, underneath the headline, there's a some small text which spans the whole column. So do avoid one column text because you're going to have to move your whole body or move your whole head to read it. Um, so don't do one column text. But luckily, they've used two columns for the rest. And then there's four columns below. So columns are good. And there's a divider line to help uh, the eyes in case there's too much white space and you can't go from column to column. And it's a kind of a, a, an instruction to the reader to read the first column and then the second column. B has two columns and it uses bordered boxes. So again, that's to, to show where the, um, the different areas are. Now the reading, as we know, um, will go from left to right and then downwards. So we would expect to read column one and then column two. But B, if you can see just about, actually, it's a bit strange because column two begins with literature review. So you wouldn't really go from introduction to methods to literature review. So the so rather than going across and down, they're expecting someone to read methods and literature review. So that's one um, 
maybe mistake that B has made. There's, there's big bold colors in A, and there's a colored title bar in B. But maybe the text is um, quite small in B. Now you'll notice because there's gaps on the right hand side, so A has left aligned text, which is actually better for reading, and B has justified, so the text is stretched across to look neater, but it's difficult to read because there's going to be odd spacing between words. There's bullet points in A, but maybe four columns is crowded and is quite solid. Similarly in B, it looks like there's too much text to read. There is some white space or blank space. The photos um, are quite small in A and uh, crowded, and the graphs as well are quite small. The graphs are spaced out, but maybe too small in B as well, and overlapping there. The conclusion is right at the bottom of A, so someone will have to crouch down to read it. Whereas the conclusion is eye level in B, it's the last paragraph of the results discussion. There's contact details in the bottom colored bar in A, and there's references at the bottom of B. So they're not two important things at the bottom. If you want to read, you, you will, but B, it is white text on photos, which again, may be too busy to read. So there's pluses and minuses for both. How about this one? This is a landscape poster. So maybe uh, put your hand up. Do you think this is a good example? Or keep your hand down if it's not a good example. So this is a landscape horizontal one. Okay, yes, a few have put their hands up. Um, so this is okay, there's also some pros and cons. So first of all, uh, of course, check with your conference organizer the direction and the size. So a standard size would be A0, like you've heard of A4, it goes um, bigger, A4, A3, A2, A0, or four to three or 16 to nine, uh, like TV size for the widescreen. Or for e-posters, so sometimes you can present on a screen at a conference. So an e-poster would use a screen that will tell you if it's horizontal or vertical, and again, they'll give you the size. But here, there's a nice picture and there's perspective, so it will draw the eye in. But if it's just the building or the university, it's not really useful. So think of a useful introductory picture, like a graphical abstract that some journals use. That would be quite good. Uh, and help the reader. Um, so if it's an e-poster at a conference, you can actually split your poster into different panels and label it page one of five, two of five, three of five. They'll give you a limit that, that you're allowed. So again, you're splitting your poster like slides so people can read it. And if it's an online conference, of course, because of COVID, uh, you can enlarge your PDF in sections on your share screen live for people to read. So it can still be a, a poster, but you can enlarge and let people read it. Or you can make slides and cut out, crop out sections of a exported JPEG or a TIFF or PNG file and make slides of each quarter. That's also a good idea. So good things about this example are there's a short title, it's white, white on blue, it's in sentence case. The main text is dark on light, it's left aligned, there's bullet points, the key information, so the lessons learned, the conclusion will be eye level. There's three columns, there's lots of white space, there's a big flowchart and a big figure to break up the text, but there's abbreviations in the second column which um, doesn't help. It's okay to use the space and expand abbreviations. Remember, the poster is meant to be standalone and self-explanatory for the audience. And here there's no acknowledgments or funding or conflicts of interest or ethics statements. Maybe not for this exact poster, it's not a research poster, but do remember to put those things. And then there are links, so that's fine for a PDF, but in a live poster it's best to use a QR code. And of course, you can link back to your uh, poster in your uh, institution website, and there's many free QR code generators online. So for colors, we can look at the color scheme. 
and we've seen this before in the uh, data presentation webinar. So go to the Asia Edit web, uh, website and you can get um, the data presentation webinar there. So colors that are opposite each other are called complementary because when you mix them, they cancel each other out and form a dark, dirty gray, if you remember from school in painting. Uh, so it's best actually to use colors that are close to each other, called analogous, or colors that are opposite but shifted by one. So split complementary, not directly opposite. Or equidistant, called triadic. And so for your color scheme, choose uh, limit your colors, choose a good scheme that's aesthetically pleasing, that looks okay, and repeat whatever scheme for the background and bars. Uh, repeat it for your figures and your uh, charts as well, so everything is harmonized. Do avoid complementary. The reason is because um, colors opposite in the color wheel will mean that a warm color, red, orange, yellow, will be opposite to a cool or cold color, purple, blue, or green. And red colors normally go towards the viewer, and cool colors go backwards. So if you put them together, you're going to get this pulsating effect. Uh, it's high contrast and things start moving and giving people a headache. So similarly, striped lines start moving about. So do avoid that and definitely avoid in your text boxes, uh, complementary colors. And very, very dark on dark boxes and light on light text on light boxes. And for gradations in your charts, um, you can use grayscale, single color, single color, partial spectrum, bipolar color, full spectrum, or qualitative. And there's a colorblind safe palette in colorbrewer2.org. So do bear in mind the few percent of people who are colorblind, especially red green, because everything will look gray. Uh, but type in the chat box, please. What there's differences. So what are the primary colors for ink and for light? So for inks, for printing, and for light on a computer or TV screen. So what are the primary colors? Yeah, red and yellow and blue. Mm -hmm. So that's what we were taught at school, red, yellow, blue. But for, that's, for, that's fine for, for painting. For printing, um, it's similar, but they call it CMYK. So the blue is cyan, the red is magenta, Y is yellow, and then K is key for black. Um, the key color black, because if you mix cyan, magenta, yellow, or even red, yellow, blue, you never get pure black. So you'll be wasting a lot of ink and it will never dry. So there's, there's actually a pure black color. So that's why you see in your um, inkjet printers, there's four cartridges for CMYK. And this um, system is subtractive mixing because the more colors you add, the more wavelengths they absorb and take away from the eye. So if you add them all together, nothing reaches the eye. So it becomes black. Now for light, it's similar, but it's actually not red, blue, yellow. It's red, green, blue, uh, because it's RGB. And when you mix them together, you get white. So the more you add, the more wavelengths are reaching the eye. And we know that if you mix them all together, you get white because the opposite happens for, through a prism because it splits into the rainbow colors. So bear this in mind, they are different color systems and they mix differently and reproduce differently. So here's an example of RGB to show, because it's difficult to believe. Um, now for newspapers, for printing, you can stare very closely. You will see CMYK dots. And of course, in your printer, inkjet printer, you can mix CMYK. But for screens, it really is uh, RGB. And when you mix them, it becomes white. And if you stand further away, you get this. And actually, this I saw in a Hong Kong supermarket um, shopping mall. It's actually this. So it really is RGB for light. Now, be careful also for screen sizes because the whole size you can see on the screen, but when you print it, you never get the color going to the edge. So you actually have to make your page size bigger, then color it 
as if it's on the screen and your printer will then cut it so you'll see the trim marks, the crop marks and this is called bleed so you need an extra three to five millimeters beyond the page size if you really want the color to go over the edge. And a screen is 72, 196 PPI pixels per inch and uses RGB. If you printed this out, a CMYK is very dark and murky and pixelated. You have to convert to CMYK and 300 dots per inch higher resolution before you print. Now, the problem with PPT PowerPoints is that it handles only RGB for 220 pixels per inch. So it's fine for screen, but uh, you'll have to convert to CMYK. So one way of doing it is to uh, convert to PDF high resolution and then convert PDF RGB to CMYK. Uh, there's a link there, uh, but ask a printer, ask your art department if you're not sure. And for layout, there's balanced, of course, or unbalanced, symmetrical and asymmetrical. You can show a direction to help the eye follow through the diagonal of the page. There's different scales. There's patterns, regular patterns here. If you know photography, there's the rule of thirds. So it's best to use those intersections of the thirds. And there's contrast. So experiment because some might work better than others. It doesn't always have to be symmetrical. So here's actually my example of what a good uh, poster would look like. There's white on dark at the top. There's lots of white space. There's three columns with bordered boxes and large headings, left aligned text with bullets, a logical order, flowchart and the methods to help uh, add a picture, and then footnotes at the bottom, which can be smaller for the people who care, who really want the details, uh, but basically keep everything brief and large and at the top. Uh, the results do include a little bit of discussion, so it's different from a manuscript. Uh, you can add more details in the QR code, or even if you're clever, you can do augmented reality. Uh, there's large figures with clear labels and call outs like the Japanese poster. You can point to the most important feature. Now the conclusion box, remember to put at the top in the corner. So if people are in a hurry, they can go straight to that conclusion box. They, they can get the answer straight away and then maybe they read it. And when they have time, they can come back to your poster to get the details. Ref, uh, references and acknowledgements go at the bottom. And then remember a call to action, add a QR code for the contact details or uh, put a copy of your poster online in the re repository like Zenodo or Figshare or Dryad and uh, include a copyright or CC Creative Commons license uh, notice for whichever one you choose. So here are some poster tips. So plan carefully, uh, check the conference guidelines for the aims and scope and whether the work has to be uh, not yet published, it has to be original. For the size, direction, the material, so whether it's uh, paper only or maybe you are allowed cloth, cloth printing is easy to transport, how to attach it, or if you upload your file, if it's an online conference or an e-poster, what file requirements. Uh, make sure you know the deadlines and the poster times. Um, you can use IMRAD, introduction, methods, results, discussion, minimal discussion, plus conclusion, or you can use another type of structure like introduction and themes and conclusion or setting problem solution and evaluation and for presentation uh, make sure it can be understood on its own it's self-explanatory minimal text use bullet points it doesn't have to be full sentences and high quality graphics and if it's someone else's do get copyright permission uh, use columns and fonts and text carefully and uh, colors uh, align your elements in your graphics package. If you're using PowerPoint, you can go to arrange then align or use um, ruler grid marks so you can align things uh, visually. So the view ruler grid lines guides and test out your PowerPoint on the, on the wall before you send it for printing. Do um, use high resolution PDF CMYK 300 DPI or if it's screen RGB 96 pixels per inch and embed your fonts if you send your file to the conference organizer and I'll show you how later and check if um, the end user uses Mac or PC make sure the fonts don't move about or the elements don't move and if you send your poster to a printer get a, a sample get a, a color proof or a, a, a printout sample to check the colors and then practice your speech with your 
poster. So get some colleagues, practice some welcoming phrases, meet and greet, practice your question and answers, explain your poster, point to the thing as if it is artwork, don't read it out. And you're meant to have a conversation to get feedback. And if you do have more details, you can show bonus results on a, lap, on a uh, Palm um, tablet computer. Uh, make sure you have some business cards to hand out or a printout version of your poster for people to take away, or you can always leave it in a clear pocket on the wall. So let's now move to slides. Very similar principles can apply to slides. So in the chat box, which is the best style, do you think, for bullets or for text in slides? Some have chosen B, some C. C, OK, so C is win winning now. Uh, so actually, C is better for slides. Um, so A, of course, is uh, if you want to write out your script, that's fine. And then you can reduce it to bullet points. You'll notice B has uh, reduced grammar. It's not full sentences. So actually, B is good style for posters because it's self-explanatory, even though the, the grammar is not perfect. It's kind of note form, but there's enough information. C is reduced reduced so much that there's only key words, you really do need the speaker to explain them. So it's just, again, like artwork, really, it's just to illustrate something, but you, you don't want to read the bullets, um, you need to explain them to the audience. And if you show them one by one, um, it will make sense to the audience when it's live. So C is the best style. And uh, so here are some basic concepts. So for you, those of you who use text speak, um, tell me in the chat box what, what did these abbreviations mean? Of course, we don't want to condense to this, uh, this extent in your slides, but this is the concept of what we should think about about the audience. So WIIFM is what's in it for me. So your audience will be thinking what's in it for me, TMI is too much information, so we don't want that. And then TLDR, you might see this in some blogs, when they say TLDR at the top of a blog and they just give you a sentence. Uh, and this is today's short attention span. It stands for too long, didn't read, or too long, don't read. So it's just the, uh, the headline, the message. So think about the audience. They don't want a lot of information on the slides and think of the level that they'll need, the amount of context and background, the level of technicality, the detail you need to give, their level of English, and whether they prefer text or listening, or maybe show a video. So good slide practice is to put um, the unimportant information in the tops and sides, so any logos or headings, so put that in the furniture and then use bullet points like this, so a maximum of eight, but only two, a level of um, hierarchy for two levels. Uh, for example, this one, um, only two levels. Text can be large and sans serif and left aligned. So left aligned, right ragged, not justified all the way across. And then keywords only, parallel grammar. So you'll notice each first word is a noun. And then animation, I don't mean anime, cartoons, but to, to adjust like this one by one. So you can control the reading speed so the audience doesn't spend their time just reading everything. So you can control the pace, use the animation function of PowerPoint for appear and fade, no, nothing too distracting, nothing jumping about. So keep everything nice and neat and minimal because you don't want the audience to read everything. Um, you don't want TMI, too much information, or you don't want TLDR. So nothing like this. Uh, avoid all capitals, avoid too many things like bold and underline and italics. Use parallel grammar and punctuation. Don't use the false justify because everything gets spread out. So similar to posters, you can use sans serif though for the headings, 50 point bold, and then subtitles, uh, sorry, title and subtitle, sans serif. Again, avoid black uh, boxes, but other colored boxes are okay. And then for the main text, the headings are 30 point 
sans serif body text 22 footnotes 18 and embed your fonts into your file if you send it so in powerpoint there's a file option save preserve fidelity when sharing this presentation embed fonts Otherwise, the other person turns it to Times or Arial by default. So another basic concept is to vary the slide style. So don't do bullets for everything. It gets boring. Uh, time it for to be about one to two minutes per slide. That's average. But you do have to time yourself giving your speech and then modify the length and number of slides. Don't use transitions that are distracting in between slides. We'll see that in a minute. So if it's introduction methods, then give something interesting for results, another style of chart, another style here, then conclusion, try to put a figure or a model. So keep everything interesting, even if it is bullet points, and don't use distracting transitions like that. Now, the basic structure for conference slides is usually a title slide. Never read out the title because people have seen it in the abstract book. And if your, if your PowerPoint has been on the screen for five minutes, you don't need to read it again, the, the actual title of the talk. Optional slides can be the agenda if it's a longish talk, your bio, biography slide, or maybe conflicts of interest that could be a, um, mandatory for the conference organizer to declare if you, uh, your funder and if you have any conflicts of interest. Then the main slides and then maybe a summary slide at the end and then usually references and acknowledgements and then a thank you slide and ask for questions and add your contact details as well. So do remember um, to align your aim with your claims as your messaging. So you can use clear bullets, but if your messages don't make sense logically, then you'll lose the audience. So remember at the um, when you plan your talk, use the same structure as your uh, research paper, but structure it in a nice story. So the motivation and study aim and approach relate to the problem. And then the ending, you'll hopefully lead to a solution. So that's your storyline. And that will be where your study claims are made, your conclusions. But your aims have to be inside your claims and the other way around, because the problem will lead to a main question and then your aim, but then that will logically lead to research question one, two, and three. Maybe if, if you're doing a hypothesis testing study, that will have three hypotheses. Each one will have its own objective. So this is your mini aim, one, two, three. And then your three findings, or maybe more findings, but uh, logically organized according to objectives. Then you lead to the conclusion and solution. So if you followed the webinar I gave, for research and grant proposal writing, um, the same structure is there. So again, you can go to the Asia Edit web website to look for the research and grant proposal webinar. But make sure you loop the conclusion and claims back to the aim. If you slightly answer the different question, then the reader, the audience will know. And so your message actually doesn't make sense. So be careful if you do use an agenda slide, it's no good just saying introduction, methods, results, discussion, because everyone knows IMRAD style. So use something more uh, interesting and meaningful related to your aims and claims. So your main question from your problem statement, maybe then research question one, research question two and three, and then a deliverable. Don't just say conclusion. Uh, what did you actually make that answers the question? So what's the solution? Maybe it's a proposed model. So this could be a good agenda slide and a good story flow. Don't use the article figures in your actual slides because it's the wrong style. Again, there's too much legends. There's too many panels. Either break up the panels into separate slides or, or just verbally say something to summarize it. You don't have to say everything, show everything. And you'll see we've um, rearranged that graphic here to tell a story. So even the figure has a nice clear heading, remember? So it's not um, underneath the figure. Like like in manuscript. So we've put the figure, the figure title at the top, we've labeled it, and we've put the key message there. It's like a mini conclusion. So this is your finding. SARS-CoV-2 PPC motif mediates cell entry. 
There's abbreviations there, but you'll be speaking, you'll be explaining them as you go. Maybe leave the axes blank, so that's a way of explaining them, rather than putting everything up there and the reader, the audience doesn't know what to look at. Uh, rather than have 90 degree axes, you can put it as a um, proper text, like the y-axis there, Read, say what, what it is. This is a percentage entry of a SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus with or without mutation. And there's three different target cells, and for each th of the three cell types, um, we see that the mock virus didn't get in, the wild type WT got in 100%, but when we mutated PPC, and then you can add some, add some markers like this. Um, remember the Japanese markers and the, the call out? So circle things you want people to look at. So we reduce the entry by mutating PPC. So PPC must be important for entry. So, okay, let's end with some slide tips for this section. So plan carefully again, check the guidelines and the file requirements and the ratio of the slides you have to upload. Check the deadlines and how long your talk should be, and then time your talk and um, the number of slides. Uh, work out what key messages you want to show on the slide. So actually each slide is like a mini poster with its own key message. Structure your message clearly. Again, you can use IMRAD, but the most important parts are your results and conclusions. Again, you can write the full script out and then learn it, but you're not going to recite it. Condense it to notes, and then minimal notes. You can use the presenter view in PowerPoint for minimal notes or bullets, but then the keywords will be what you'll use in the bullet points. Uh, again, only two levels of bullets. Uh, keep everything clear with clear graphics. Copyright permission if you're reproducing someone else's figures, and then use a variety of slides for interest. And then prepare your formats well. White background is okay, 96 pixels per inch RGB, red, green, blue, uh, use the animation ordering to control the reading pace and ordering, and make backups, remember, and then know what system the conference will be using, Mac or PC. And then if you can, when you arrive uh, on a stage for your slide talk, test everything out, test the AV connection, the audio visual, test the mic, laser pointers, where you're meant to stand, and then in an online conference, of course, check your own computer, laptop, webcam, Wi-Fi, use a cable, check your headset, um, test the platform, whether it's GoTo or Zoom, uh, join early, test your slides, test the mute and unmute, know whether the question section will be live, people aren't asking questions, or whether it's going to be by question box, and then, of course, practice with your colleagues. Uh, you need to practice body language, so this is more like a performance as well. So you do have to practice, make eye contact and smile and use a clear voice. Don't read, don't memorize, but you will have to memorize the very beginning, very end, because that uh, you don't want to look at notes. And then um, have ready for the Q&A session. Uh, if you do have some bonus results, have those ready in slides at the end, in case you need to refer to those. Okay, so we've reached the last um, section. So this is actually some tips for what you you say at a conference. So when you do make your speech, whether it's posters or slides, your job is not to just present. Uh, you are there to have a conversation with your audience. So with the first thing is to attract attention. I don't mean wave and, and get someone to come to your poster. Uh, hopefully your abstract already attracts attention. People normally have access to the abstract either in a book or online. They can read what they're interested in and they'll know what, what to visit, what to go to. So make your abstract interesting, of course. Then in the actual live session, present and answer the questions, but then do get feedback and have a conversation with the audience. You're there to, to share and learn and to try to improve your paper if it hasn't been published yet. And then you're there to hone and gain more expertise and meet your peers and network with them. They could be your future colleagues, a new boss, uh, editor of a journal that you submit to or submit manuscripts to, or maybe become a reviewer or editor of in the future. But do be careful of conferences. There are predatory conferences like predatory journals. So there's a website, Think, Check, Attend, with some questions, a checklist to check to make sure that you're not paying money and attending a fake conference with um, fake 
conference book, conference supplement, conference um, uh, proceedings, and then you've lost your intellectual property. So uh, remember for predatory journals and predatory uh, supplements, there's think, check, submit, but for conferences, don't get conned, uh, look at think, check, attend. So you're there to have a conversation and here's my three C's. So the first is context. So do plan your what you want to say with clear concept, clear messages. So it's going to be a, a story with a logical sequence and not just your results, but um, tell the research story and the human side of how you got to the results. And context includes the references and the published research that will give the context of the study. And later, you'll be comparing your results with, again, the literature, you'll be giving the context of your findings. So do set the scene, use the published literature, and explain why you're doing your study, when and where, who you're doing it with, whom you're studying, how you did your study, that's all the context. The main part, of course, is the evidence and the strength of your findings. So that's the content. And be confident in communicating your findings and also the value, academic and non-academic value of your findings and their implications for your field, for the world. So this will be the what as well as the so what, what do your findings mean? And then the third C is contact. So you're trying to converse with your audience, make collaborative connections and get them interested in your work. Actually, you're trying to argue and get them to believe your conclusions. So make your case, invite feedback, answer questions, and remember the, the call to action, the QR code, or even when you're speaking, you want them to do something, even if it is to believe you, change their way of thinking. Um, so that's the now what, what, what do you want them to do with your findings? So we said before, align your aims with your claims, of course, make sure your claims or conclusions are correct and logical and supported with evidence. But the aims, uh, again, have to be aligned with your claims, but they have to be attention getting, interesting and memorable. You're not there just to read out your results to the audience. So get their attention, get them interested in your work because you're trying to have a conversation and do something with your work. What do you want to do? You want the audience to do something. In marketing, this is called ADA, awareness, interest, either desire or decision, and then action. You want the audience to actually do something, whether it is just to believe you. And so your poster, your slides, they're just the catalyst for you to give your argument and get the audience on your side. So for posters, of course, don't block your poster, stand to one side. For presentations, hopefully the podium, the lectern is moved around so you don't hide your slides. And then for work from home, conference, um, webinar, virtual conference, can you put in the chat box what's wrong with this setup for um, this conference delegate presenting their poster? What's wrong with the setup? Yes, it's facing a window and very informal background. Yes, you don't want people having glare, a mirror, um, plant head, um, and then teddy bear collection. Um, sometimes this is called house embarrassment. You could get embarrassment, embarrassed of your house, wall embarrassment maybe. So make sure you face it the other way and have a clear wall, have a lighting source, and then headset. So this is a better setup. So when you go to a conference, actually, if it's not your poster session, you can put your poster up. Someone will read the abstract and go to your poster. If it's self-explanatory and standalone, it'll be like artwork. Um, there's enough there for them to understand, like the description in a museum uh, picture. When you are there, attract attention, um, see people who maybe saw your poster the other day and then they want to meet you. So talk to them, greet them, say, hello. Um, can I show you how we are fighting plastic pollution. Can I show you how we've improved this method? So remember um, to say, can I show you something? And then you're pointing to the fig figures, really. You're not reading the same text in your poster and you're not saying, can I tell you something? Uh, say, can I show you something? If you go to a shop, you want a demonstration of the gadget. You don't just want someone to tell you um, what the gadget can do. Then this can lead to a conversation. You can tell the person your work, ask them to um, ask any questions, 
And then you can, after you've told them the minimum, you can tell them more details on your methods, results, and then the human aspect. And what were you surprised at? Um, what do you want feedback for? Um, and then you can actually have a proper conversation. Now, the problem with slide presentations is that it's one way. So this means you have to imagine that you're, you are talking to the audience and as well as presenting your results, do give them more of the human side of the story and then ask them if they have questions. Then you can answer the questions and have tea and talk more afterwards. So again, the, the point is to have a conversation with um, the few that want to talk to you, you'll find them in the end. So for effective communication, here's three E's. Of course, you need to be ethical and credible. So give your elevator pitch or your bio slide to say who you are, and then be enthusiastic and cite credible sources, don't exaggerate. So be believable. Then your message has to be strong and good evidence. So data and facts and convincing structure and trustworthy, transparent, and then you have to be engaging with your audience, empathize with the human interest of the story, the values of the audience, and the level of their language and technicality, and then tell a story with your results. Uh, front load, which means give the conclusion first, actually. So remember, you, you say, hello, can I tell you, no, not hell, can I show you um, how we've improved this method? So you give the conclusion first. Uh, remember photography rule of thirds so same with text give three points uh, give analogies and then involve the audience by asking questions you can say oh uh, who's heard of this method then you can know whether you need to give more detail or not or you can ask rhetorical questions um, like oh what does this mean and then you you're actually going to tell them what it means or you can ask um, imaginary questions or imaginary um, instructions like, oh, when was the last time um, you did this? Or imagine if you saw this. So you're involving the audience. So it is a performance when you're giving a live um, slide talk. So you need effective visual aids. And then the voice has to be clear, of course. So elocution and eloquence. And then uh, it's body language too. So expressiveness and expression, body language and your face gestures. Uh, the language you use has to be semi-formal and conversational, so um, use a lot of we's and you. So what we did was, here you can see and then point to something. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And then uh, don't use jargon or colloquialisms, the screen's all out of whack. That means the screen's not working. So then the technician hopefully will come and help you. Tell a story. So instead of saying the aim of our study was like a paper, just give the conclusion first. Um, the public really needs our help to learn to verify science news. Then you can say why and what you found. So instead of IMRAD, uh, introduction, method, results, discussion, uh, you give the conclusion first. So that's a teaser, synopsis, then orientation, complication, climax, resolution, coda. So films, novels use this. So basically set the scene, present a problem and then present a bigger problem and then solve it. And then what did you learn? And then in the Q&A, there's some phrases you can use. If you can't hear a question, you can say, oh, could you repeat that please? Um, and then repeat it to the audience. So the question is, and then say it again. Uh, if someone has a complicated question, you can say, oh, thank you. I think your question is about, and then you can give the closest to um, maybe an answer you know, and then paraphrase. And then if it's really too difficult, you can say, can I get back to you by email? Can we chat in the coffee session? If it's not a question, but quite a harsh criticism, you can still say, thank you. I think you're referring to, and then name whatever topic or issue it is. Don't repeat any negative words, but try to turn it around to something positive. And you can say, oh, we actually checked for that. So it's not a problem. And then uh, finally, some uh, tips for uh, presenting. So of course, proofread, proofread your slides carefully. Again, you can write out your speech first, but turn it into notes before your visuals. So you know the structure is going to be the same. Time yourself, of course, 
and then use your body language, practice in front of your colleagues. Be careful of words that have different meanings, verbs and nouns. So increase is going to be the, uh, the noun, but increase is the verb. And then dress smartly, of course, when you go to a live conference, even if it's on um, webinars, on Zoom. Take deep breaths, sip water, keep yourself calm. If it's online, reboot your computer before and turn off any apps. Um, smile when you're giving your um, talk and uh, stay upright, keep calm. You may have to speed up or slow down depending on how much time you have. For questions, get to the point, answer the question, um, offer to get back to the person and always remain polite. And then post-mortem, um, Afterwards, you can correct your slides if you have to upload them somewhere. Uh, think about what worked, what didn't work, and make contact with the people that you network, networked with. Uh, maybe it's an editor who invited you to, to submit a manuscript. OK, so we've gone through some tips for the science and art of making research posters and slides. And we've looked at uh, what you say when you deliver your presentation. So hopefully you have confident uh, conference conversations. So that's also a tongue twister you can say to yourself to uh, keep your mind off being nervous at the beginning. So smile at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm going to make confident conference conversations and then, then you can go on the stage. So do some voice um, practice um, before you give a talk. So. Right now, you can ask me any questions. I'll be happy to answer your questions. You can type them in the Q&A box. Um, here's a QR code on our Asia Edit website while you're waiting. So please uh, let me know your questions on posters or slides or what to say at a conference. I also have some frequently asked questions. Um, now, I said never, I didn't say this, but actually never repeat your abstract in your poster, either at the top. There's no point putting an abstract inside your poster and then wasting space because actually your poster is a kind of abstract because you'll be giving introduction methods results conclusion. So it's actually the same as abstract. So there's no point having abstract and then abstract. And there's no point because the abstract is in the conference book and people have read the abstract to come to your talk. So actually your poster can be different uh, because the conference abstract might have been at an early stage when you didn't have results. So you might have to say, we will show blah, blah, blah. And then your poster has the real results. So you, it won't be the same as the abstract. Or between the abstract and your poster, uh, you might have different results. So it might be different from what you submitted. So again, you can explain to people that you did a, a different experiment and got different results. So never repeat your abstract inside your poster. Oh, someone's asked whether, um, how about slides for humanities? Or where there's no numbers and tables. Well, if you noticed um, when I gave the IMRAD um, in one of the bullets, uh, I said you can also do introduction, themes, conclusion. So then you will have your different themes. If you're doing um, social sciences research, you will also have methods. Uh, you can actually just have question answer. If there's no logical way to present it, remember, get your key messages first planned out and then uh, you can present it as question and answer. But as long as you have a clear introduction and conclusion to tie everything together, uh, then that's one way of presenting uh, humanities research. And also, if you noticed in uh, this slide near the end for Q&A sessions, for, I show two speech bubbles. So what happens if someone asks a difficult question, you can answer this. So again, you can, if it's just text or something boring, you can present it in a visual way. Um, so do speech bubbles. Uh, you, you might have to think of a, an imaginative way to present or cut up your text um, in big figures, pretend they are figures. 
I might have to do like a mind map and point arrows to things. So it doesn't have to just be blocks of text. So always try to avoid blocks of text. Someone's asked, um, how about durations? Yeah, that's a good question. So th oh, these are coming in the chat box. That's fine. You can type in the chat box. Um, so actually, the most difficult is like a one or three minute lightning talk. So either sometimes um, your seminars might do this in your department. You only have three minutes, one slide. So then you prefer, prepare your slide like a poster, um, or you make one slide, make one poster, but cut it into easy chunks to talk about, but you keep it to three minutes. And then you'll have to just give a very quick introduction sentence, like a lift um, elevator speech, then give the main messages and then conclusion. Sometimes some conferences have the three minute, one slide, format for posters that the day before you can advertise your session and talk about your poster. So again, you can talk about the most important part of your poster, maybe the conclusion box, and try to attract people, tell them what they'll see when they come to your poster. So that's a short version. And then for maybe 10 minutes, you know that the last four minutes is going to be Q&A, so it's not really going to be 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So three or four minutes is Q&A. And that's actually where you get most of the value from, from conferences. So again, keep your messages short, treat them like little posters, like Japanese information posters. Um, there's no rule. Um, slides is one minute to two minutes per slide. You have to practice beforehand. Maybe there's a busy slide, which will take a long time to go through. Maybe there's a few easy picture slides. So it really depends. But that's a good question, but you, it means you do have to practice your talk. For posters though, when you present, keep it to five minutes. Uh, when you talk to someone at the beginning, you only have maybe 30 seconds to attract them to come to your poster and stay. And then you should have five minutes. Uh, it should be plenty of time practice to give all the main information, pointing at the figures, so none of the text. If they want to ask more, then you can extend the conversation. Again, it depends if many people come to your poster, then you have to have fast turnarounds or maybe group them together and then give a longer talk to a group of them. Um, but uh, in a, an online poster session, uh, the conference organizer might open a breakout room like in Zoom. So it'll be you in a room that people come and visit. And again, you can do it in cycles to present your poster and then ask answer questions or the conference might actually have a website where your pdf and your even your one minute speech three minute speech is there but people can see the poster beforehand and then they come to the breakout room to chat to you so you might have 45 minutes or an hour just to chat to people and again have your screen share ready in case you want to show your pdf version um, of your poster there's still time for a few more questions Yes, the number of words to use um, in the poster is actually going to be less than 500. It's, if it's going to be like an abstract, which is 200, 250 words, that's a good um, target. So remember, keep everything brief, only key messages and bullet points, but definitely not a thousand words. And before I mentioned CC Creative Commons. So if you do put your poster online in a repository, you have the choice of CC BY, which is the generous user license. So people can reuse your work as long as they cite and attribute the work to you. So that's CC BY. You can choose a really restrictive CC license, which is CC BY NCND, non-commercial and non-derivative, which means people can reuse your work, but only in a, in a non-commercial setting, and only if they show the whole poster as a whole thing. They can't cut it up uh, or modify any bit of it. So that's quite restrictive, CC BY NCND. It depends on how generous you are to share your poster with people in an open access style. 
some people have asked me before in different webinars, what if you have a patent application and you're actually meant to keep everything secret because you want to file a patent. So in the conference, um, that means you present less than you normally would because you don't want it becoming public. And then you might have to put a little sign on your poster saying, please do not photograph this poster. I don't want it to be public. It's only for a specialized audience. That's usually allowable. You have to check the laws of your country if you do, um, if you are filing for a patent. Uh, and in that case, you wouldn't put your poster online for public um, use and for public viewing. So be careful if you um, are applying for patents. Okay, so actually we've gone over time. So we've reached the end and I'd like to thank you very much for joining this webinar. I hope you found it useful and the recording will be available online at the Asia Edit website. And so until next time, please visit the website for more free educational information. Until next time, I wish you success. Goodbye and stay safe.